Ben Wattenberg. The United Nations has long been known for its concern about overpopulation, but now it has another problem. According to the eye-opening data in this bland-looking document, the following case can be made. Never before have birth rates fallen so far, so fast, so low, for so long, all over the world. The potential implications environmentally, economically, geopolitically, and personally are both unclear and monumental for good, for ill, or for both. In the next half hour, we will go behind the scenes at the United Nations and talk to demographers from Asia, Europe, and of course, America. The topic before the house, is the population explosion over? This week on Think Tank. Sometimes on Think Tank, I will turn to a guest and say, okay, Professor Jones, you're driving the bus. That is, Professor Jones, lay out your case for us before we uh, comment on it, either adversely or positively. Uh, today, on this issue of uh, demographics, I am going to drive the bus. <laughs> Over the last 35 years, I've done books, articles, and television programs about population and developed my own sometimes controversial views. Most recently, I wrote an article in the New York Times Magazine section that generated a blizzard of response. Later in the program, we will be talking with a distinguished demographer, Dr. Aline Gelbard of the Population Reference Bureau, who has her own views about what's going on. To begin our crash course on modern demography, let's take a look at this document recently published by the United Nations. A central index of population growth is the total fertility rate. That is, the average number of children born per woman over the course of a lifetime. After World War II, global fertility rates ranged near five children per woman for several decades, triggering talk of a population explosion. After all, for a modern country, a total fertility rate of 2.1 children per woman yields population stability over time. It's a magic number because it represents the number of children a woman would have to have on average to keep one generation as large as the previous generation. It's the replacement level. By the mid-1970s, those high rates began tumbling. Five, four, three, less than three, down now to 2.79. How come? There are almost as many reasons as there are countries in the world, including but not limited to urbanization, more education for women, higher incomes, legal abortion, better contraception methods, greater acceptance of homosexuality, later marriage, difficulty of conception at older ages, more divorce, and lower infant mortality rates. But that global trend line tends to mask some very different situations. In the modern developed nations, fertility rates fell to and then well below the replacement level by the mid-1970s and kept going down to 1.59 children per woman. These low rates have never before been seen on this planet, at least not among civilizations that have survived. Italy has the lowest fertility in the world or in the history of the world. If fertility will remain constant at this level, the, in the 200 years ahead, uh, Italian population will disappear. Antonio Golini, yes, demographer at the University of Rome. Nothing, no, 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 no population, right, right, nothing right. at all. Uh, but I think that this is just a, a, a mathematical, uh, statistical speculation. And we can say that uh, if uh, fertility will remain at the same level uh, for 30, 40 years, uh, Italian population will be reduced by one third, more or less. 
France also has a low fertility problem. Nobody I know, no demographer, no social thinker who could have imagined that societies could have below, much below replacement fertility and that so many couples would, would remain childless. That's totally new. If, if the French fertility rate is 1.6 or 1.7, uh, that's still 20 to 25 percent below replacement. That's true. that's a big, it's a big true. gap. That's a big gap, and the real problem is that the gap is a long-term gap. We have this gap since now more than two decades, and we don't see any perspective of change or reversal. What's happening in the less developed countries, the so-called LDCs? show a similar trajectory down, but from a much higher base. That drop from six children per woman in the late 1960s to three children per woman in the late 1990s is the fastest on record, and although still moderately above the replacement level, continuing to fall rapidly. American fertility rates have fallen as well below the replacement rate for 25 consecutive years, but to levels higher than in Japan or Europe. What have these rates yielded in terms of total global population? Dramatic growth from 2.5 billion people in 1950 to 5.9 billion people in the late 1990s. So, falling fertility rates and climbing population a battle of trends between a population explosion and a baby bust. Which trend will prevail? The United Nations offered three scenarios in their 1996 data volume, high, medium, and low. Now, as fertility rates keep falling, the United Nations is preparing to lower that so-called medium rate for their 1998 publication. In late November of 1997, for the first time ever, the UN called together demographers from nations where fertility rates have already fallen below the replacement level. I was invited to participate in the discussion and to interview some of the participants. The total fertility rate in Germany today is 1.3, and it's one of the lowest level in the world. I think there are a number of things that are going on, and I'll try to be very short. I think, firstly, we're now in a time of the world in which fertility rates, the number of children couples are having, is declining everywhere. Not just in, in the West, not just in Europe or Northern America, but in Asia, Latin America, and over the last 10 years in Africa. It's, uh, fertility still remains very high in Africa, but it's begun to decline, and we know once fertility declines, historical experience tells us it will continue to decline. Uh, the total fertility rate in China currently is about uh, two, a little below two. On average, fertility is going down in the world, yes. But in European countries, fertility is now leveling off, and in a, a number of places it's gone back up. An uh, example of uh, a situation where it went up fairly sharply when the timing of childbearing changed is Sweden. Sweden had low fertility about 1.5, 1.6 in the 70s and early 80s. And in the late 80s, the government implemented a program that encouraged women to have children and children early. That had an immediate effect uh, by changing not only the number of children women had, but also the timing and fertility uh, jumped from 1.6 or so to about 2 in a very brief time. And then it went down again. And uh, eventually it came down because these uh, measures, I think, were in fact uh, not continued over time. If it had, I think, uh, they might have had uh, more of an effect. I believe that global fertility rates will continue to go down. Now, is this good news or bad news? To discuss the data and the outlook, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Aline Gelbard, who has her doctorate in population dynamics from Johns Hopkins University and is now director of international programs for the Population Reference Bureau. Uh, Aline, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Let me begin with something you wrote in a letter to the New York Times about that article that I wrote. Uh, which you said that I, me, Ben, quotes, 
exaggerate the pervasiveness and the future certainty of these fertility declines. Now, what did you mean by that? Well, there were two, two reasons. One is that um, taking an, a, a region like Africa, you said that the, in many countries there, the rates were plunging. And in fact, there are really only three countries were, that I would characterize having had, had plunging fertility rates over the last 30 years, um, two island countries, Réunion, Mauritius, and then South Africa. And uh, for the region as a whole, it, it has declined, but very slowly. For Sub-Saharan Africa, the total fertility is, has gone from just under seven to over five. So they still have a long way to go before reaching the replacement level fertility that you mentioned. And the second factor is that even though these fertility rates are declining, and I agree with you about the, how dramatically they have declined when you look at them on a global basis, um, in addition to regional differences, they, the, the, um, the impact of these uh, declines, you can't, you can't look at what's happening in Europe and say that that same thing is going to happen very soon in a lot of developing countries because these countries have yet much younger age structures and, uh, than, than European countries. And it's true that, that a country can't begin to stabilize or or decline in terms of population growth until after it has reached replacement level fertility or two children on average per woman. But uh, th it also doesn't start declining immediately or very soon thereafter um, unless it's a much older population. You say that the uh, African fertility rates have fallen from a little below seven to a little above five. Now, um, that decline is very interesting. First of all, uh, the African rates, unlike those of countries all over the world, had remained very high till very, very recently. And everybody said the standard argument in this kind of a discussion was, what about Africa? Mm -hmm. They're still up there. Mm -hmm. Now, th these declines in Africa, if I recall correctly, really happened in the last 10 to 15 years. This is a, a, and the United Nations itself characterized, I didn't use that word sort of cavalierly, they said that the African drop in the fertility rate was the fastest ever recorded in terms of gross numbers. When you go from seven to five, and you only have to get to about two and a half, you don't have to go to zero, you gotta get to roughly two and a half for a non-modern country to hit replacement. I mean, we could argue whether that's dramatic or plunging, but it's, it's pretty significant, I mean particularly given the history of it having been the laggard. Well, but let's go back to what your premise is. Uh, the, the article, you titled the article, The Population Explosion is Over, and the premise is that the declines that we've seen in developed countries, and at, well, in developing countries as well, are going to lead s soon, was the impression that you conveyed, to uh, declining population. Let's, let's look at the conditions that are, are facilitating the declines that we are seeing. And uh, they are, but what we see around the world is that uh, infant mortality, when the infant mortality declines, I think you've mentioned all these things again, so I, I, won't, I won't go no, belabor no, no, the no, point, but right, in, in, infant mortality, family planning has increased dramatically, which both helps people to have healthier children and space children, and uh, it has a lot of demographic effects and health effects. And education, particularly education for women. If we are going to continue to see declines in fertility, investments will have to continue to be made in those things because you've got no. new populations of well, girls. But, but, but those investments, on. I mean, the, the argument has been made in the, in the population community, certainly by the United Nations, that if we, the United Nations, do not get enough money, so many billion dollars, then population will go back up. Uh, that rates will go back up. And I must, if I could characterize that in one academic word, I would say it's baloney. I, I, I mean, you know, the, the um, uh, family planning programs are not usually expensive programs. I mean, they're not building pipelines, they're not building, uh, you know, uh, desalinization plants. It, it, the, the, these are programs that uh, countries can, for the most part, or in large measure, carry on by themselves. There are bilateral uh, uh, aid uh, going. There is, moreover, a lot of evidence, with all due respect to the good work that the United Nations and agencies like the, uh, the Population Reference Bureau have, have done uh, 
to encourage family planning around the world. There is a modernization program. Uh, th there is a modernization phenomenon going on around the world that has pulled fertility rates lower, even in countries where there have not been these formal programs. Well, I think that we, are, we have seen uh, a dramatic decline. I, I, I agree with that in most places. But I don't think we can guarantee that we're going to continue to see those same declines. Those declines haven't just happened. Uh, they, they really have been affected by very concerted uh, investments in, in social development, uh, to use a term that probably a lot of people aren't wild about, but it hasn't been just economic development. They've been investments in people's health and giving people the uh, ability to make their own decisions about when to have children and when not to have children. I raised the issue of education because... But, but, but what well, evidence do you see that, that, that there's a turnaround in that? I'm I mean, not saying there's a turnaround. What I'm saying is that uh, you are not the only person who, although I, th I think you've gotten given most attention to this issue, and I, and I think yeah, you should be uh, applauded for pointing out that yeah, there's, yeah, more yeah. Than, <laughs> than there, there's more than just growth going on when you look at global trends. But the, the, uh, um, the, the concern that a lot of people have and had with your article in, in the New York Times is that, um, well, it's, it's, it's a process that's gotten launched and we don't have to worry about making those same kinds of investments anymore. I wrote this book, The Birth Dearth, in the mid-80s and was already saying, my God, these things are so low. And the, the reason I got back interested in this whole thing was I looked at them again uh, late last year and they just gone another 15 or 20 percent lower from rates that were already very low. And, and you start, you know, you think about the discussions we've had in the United States about the Social Security crisis, for example, which is basically driven by this whole demographic situation of lower birth rates not being able to support elderly populations. We have it here in the, in the European countries and in Japan. They are devastating economic problems because they don't have payers in, they have recipients, they're going to have to dramatically uh, alter their economies and, and their social welfare programs. And, and I just think it's a, it's a real problem. You're portraying a scenario which I, I agree with, I mean, is very, is very threatening to people in their old age, not to have workers coming along if we have a social security system like we do or social welfare systems as in many European countries that can provide enough resources to enable people to live good quality lives in their older ages, um, uh, you know, and, and depending on, on I mean, it varies in terms of how much they are dependent on a social system or, or, or not. So again, thinking about uh, what are the conditions that might precipitate an increase. If you imagine a scenario where these countries, people in these countries look around and say, if I don't have children to help me in my old age, nobody else will. So I, I raise that because I go back to the fact that you really do need to look at these conditions. How likely are they to continue? And people's decisions are, are really influenced by not only their own well-being, but how, what can they provide for their children. So okay, let, let's talk now about, the, you brought up uh, again, the less developed world. Let, let's talk about that. Uh, we saw in those uh, charts uh, in, in the beginning of the program that these are uh, fertility rates for the less developed world have gone in the last 30 or so years from about six children per woman to just a little bit above three children per woman. Uh, and you need about 2.5, 2.4 for replacement in those sorts of societies, maybe a little less. Now, uh, uh, China has gone way, way down below replacement. Of course, there has been some coercion there, so that's a special case. Uh, India, which was regarded as a great basket case for, for so many years, has gone from about six children to about 3.3. Uh, and, and let us stipulate that these are younger populations and there is continued population growth even at low fertility rates. That is, mm -hmm. we agree on that. That is absolutely correct. On the other hand, if you're going to go down to population decline, that is a period just arithmetically you have to go through because mm -hmm. of the nature of the societies. Uh, isn't it logical to say after 30 years of dramatic, uh, or 20 years at least, of dramatic drop in the fertility rates in the less developed worlds, apparently at an accelerating rate in this last 10 or so years, that that is likely to continue? Well, two, two responses. One is that anytime you introduce something new, and let's just take family planning, which was something that was sure. new to a lot of couples uh, who wanted to have fewer children, once the idea 
took hold that if you had fewer, you could have fewer and healthier children by doing something like using family planning. Sure. Um, then you always, there's always a, a, a group of people, it's like any new idea or innovation, innovation or any new product, there are always a lot of people who will say, gee, I really needed this and, and will respond immediately. So that could be one factor for contributing to, to such a decline that may not imply the same rate of decline in the future. So you, you have to um, continue to make, again, these investments that I've talked about. And the question is, is will countries be able to keep making those investments? Remember that the populations are still like growing. things like health and education. Exactly. But, but I, will I, they, is there any evidence? I mean, I, any, everything I've seen goes in the other direction, is that uh, health is getting better in those less developed countries, infant mortality is getting lower, uh, women are staying in school longer, uh, there is more contraception uh, available, people are moving from farm to cities. Just about every um, aspect of this situation that you can examine, the indicators are pointing toward uh, a continuation of this 30-year diminishment of, pop of, as, of fertility. As long as these countries keep making these investments, and that's what I think the, the concern about assuming this is just going to continue uh, excludes the fact that this didn't happen by itself, that there were a lot of efforts to make these services and these resources available to people. And, and you also can't assume that the, say, say you have populations um, that are, are, have a lot of, of women with no education. Again, going back to those research findings I was citing, if you've got, you reach a point where maybe you've reached everybody who's got a certain level of education and, and fine, they are having children when they want them and how many they want to have. We still see around the world within each of these countries you've talked about with these declining fertility patterns that women with no education have more children than they want to have and sometimes more educated women do too. These things aren't, you know, family planning, other things aren't foolproof. But there's a, a larger gap among uneducated women than educated women. So what I'm trying to say is that there are still, there are, are still populations within yeah, these no, populations. I, I, I would agree with that. But is your concern about these less developed countries um, not so much about how many people there are, but how poor they are? It's a, it's a question of their quality of life. And, and how well equipped those countries are able to provide that, that has for, for those populations. Do you think population growth diminishes quality of life? Not always. It really, we have examples throughout history where population growth was a good thing. Take like, a look at the United look States. Look at the United States. But it's... And, and, and even within the United States, those areas that have low population growth or negative population growth, like rural areas and inner cities, they are doing the worst, and the areas with the highest population growth, the sort of hot suburbs, are doing the best. And, and, and that's a very good example of how you've got to look at the context, mm -hmm. where rapid population growth is detrimental to the quality of life, is where you've got weak economic structures, weak political structures, and they are, they are in urban areas or whatever you look at, they are unable to provide for and make the investments so that the people in those populations can, can uh, have, have health and education and mm -hmm. the wherewithal to compete effectively. And Let's uh, just wrap this up and let, let me see if I can formulate what we do agree on uh, okay. and then we can, we can stop. C can we agree on, on this statement? Uh, there are demographic changes going on uh, in the downward direction that are happening more rapidly than any of us had expected. Yes. Uh, with consequences that we don't yet fully understand, but that we ought to keep a very close eye on. Yes, and I would add. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, I got <laughs> you have it. to let me. Okay, add. Fine. Go ahead. And I would add that. That we shouldn't allow ourselves to, to uh, think only about those trends. You have to look at the consequences of those trends uh, globally, and there's still a huge amount of growth sure. going on. I, even, I would accept that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and thank you. Uh, for Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to 
New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.